Hops add bitterness, flavour and aroma to beer and as brewers we want to get the most out of those precious hops. For years I've been putting my hops into a hop sleeve but would I be better off tossing them directly into the kettle? To find out I'm brewing two pale lagers side by side where everything is identical except how I add those hops. Then I'm serving the beers to tasters, including a special guest, to see if they can tell a difference between these hopped up brews. This episode is sponsored by iBrewlosophy Patreon members. More on that in a bit. So the process I'm using today is very much inspired by Steve of the Apartment Brewer YouTube channel. I've been watching him just throw hops into his kettle with no hop spider, no hot sleeve, and thinking like, how is he getting away with that? But also thinking, I've got to imagine that's going to make a difference to the finished beer. So that is what I'm going to find out today. Two beers, exactly the same recipe. They're both IPLs. They both use El Dorado hops. But this one, I'm going to be adding the hops directly into the kettle. And this one, I'm going to be using my usual hop sleeve. Now this grain is just one thing, Pilsner malt, particularly modern Pilsner from Epiphany Craft Malts. I'm brewing a 5.5 gallon batch. This is 10 and a half pounds of Pilsner malt. And should give me an original gravity of around 10.50 when we're done. Oh, that one comes out in all of them. If you look up there, you can see the internet watching you. Right, I'm out of it. <laughs> That's my mum. I'm mashing here at 154 Fahrenheit, that is 68 Celsius. Let's start recirculation here and I'm going to mash in this guy in about 20 minutes. So I've got 20 minutes buffer between these two. Right, it's been about 20 minutes. Now I'm trying to isolate this down to a single variable, which is throwing in the hops directly into the kettle versus putting the hops into a sleeve. But to do that, I'm going to need to perform a whirlpool and to do that it means that I need to remove the bazooka screen that's in this kettle. So this is it. Now technically only this system needs to perform a whirlpool in order to settle all of the hops to the bottom of the kettle and allow me to safely draw out the wort. But so that I'm not comparing a beer that had hops in the kettle and a whirlpool with a beer that had hops in a sleeve and no whirlpool, I'm going to whirlpool in both which means I've removed the bazooka screen in both of these kettles. In with the grains. Oh, well, something I read as I didn't mention earlier was that I have added water salts to both of these batches. Gypsum and calcium chloride. All right, 60 minutes for this guy. And there's about 40 minutes left on this one. All right, let's talk hops. I've got this batch now up to boil. So the hop schedule I'm using, well, first of all, which hop? I'm using El Dorado hops. I'm going to use that throughout as the bittering flavor and aroma additions. I think using the same hop throughout is pretty good for this test because we really are trying to see can we pick out a particular hop difference and once you start adding different hops in the mix maybe it gets a little bit harder to distinguish. Now this being an international pale lager it's not hopped very highly. I'm going for an IBU of around 20 or so. El Dorado is quite a high alpha acid hop. This one is about 30%. So my hop schedule is to add a hop addition at 60 minutes, 30 minutes and 5 minutes. The 30 minutes and 5 minute additions are going to be 10 grams. For the bittering addition, the 60 minute addition, 2 grams. Yeah, 2 grams of hops is all I need in order to hit my IBU target. So I'm going to just put this tiny, tiny amount of hops, this, into the beer. I thought it would be a bit weirder doing this, not putting it in a sleeve, because I always put it in a sleeve, but there weren't really enough hops to feel very weird here. Now for batch number two, I am using my hop sleeve. Use this in every batch I've ever brewed in these four hammer systems. So this is very familiar to me, but is it really holding back some of these hop flavors and aromas? Well, let's add it in. And then I have my giant charge of two grams of pepper hops into the sleeve this time. Oh, and uh, it's time for the 30 minute edition with this guy. So 10 grams now of El Dorado, and I'm just gonna 
Sprinkle it. This is more like it. 30 minute addition going into batch two, into the sleeve. Now I'm also ready to cut this off so it's going to turn off the heat. Now I'm running this wort and recirculating it through my counterflow chiller. So that's sanitizing the counterflow chiller. But now I need to do the whirlpool. So the idea here is all these pops that are at the bottom of this kettle now, I need to collect them into the center of the kettle so I can get the wort out without getting the pops out and blocking everything up. Now, because I'm using a counterflow chiller, I'm fine with the recirculation. It's not going to get blocked. Perhaps a plate chiller, I'd be more concerned. Um, but here is where the little whirlpool comes in. So I'm using this whirlpool arm from Core Hammer Supply. Never used this before, but basically you just put it into the wort and I'm going to put my wort that's recirculating into the kettle now into this. It's going to send it to the bottom of the kettle and that should cause a whirlpool. Connect this to the whirlpool arm. It's just a quick connect like everything else on the system. There we go. And now if I just run the pump, you see the work coming out there. I'm going to turn that off. It's going to get real hot, real fast. That's boiling. Uh, so I'm just going to put this on the edge of the kettle here like this and now turn it on. Here we go. And I can start to see the whirlpool form here. And I'm just going to leave it running like this for about five minutes. So that's five minutes. I'm going to stop it here. And the next stage to this is just to let it settle. And the recommendation here is to let it settle for about 15 minutes and then move into chilling. Now there is a bit of a summarization still going on here. So I'm adding a little bit of bitterness still to this beer. I don't think very much, but yeah, I'm at 185 Fahrenheit right now. And anything really above 180 Fahrenheit, that's when you're going to see a summarization. So, yep, those hops are still releasing their alpha acids into that work. But it's only a little bit. I don't think it's going to make much difference. But that is a reason why I'm going to do this exact same process, even though it's completely unnecessary, into this guy. So the second batch is now in the fermenter. And now I've got a chance to catch my breath. And I'm not trying to do two things at once, like add the hop addition into here and then start the whirlpool here. Let's just recap what I've been doing here with this whirlpool. The bazooka screen. Why did I take that out? Well, this has a very fine mesh and it gets blocked up at the best of times if you're not careful. So I needed to remove this because otherwise the hot matter in here would have stopped any kind of recirculation. So that was a recommendation from Clawhammer actually that I take these out. Then what I did was I did the recirculation. So I'm going through my counterflow chiller here and I really don't have to worry about any blockages at this point. And at this point, I probably am sending hot matter through my counterflow chiller, but who cares? Because it's got really thick pipes. It's not going to get blocked up and it just pumps it straight back into here. That's fine. I did the whirlpool for five minutes. The idea is that's going to compact the hops into the middle. And then the 15 minutes settling is just to make sure that that forms a steady base and then you're taking stuff out. And now when I take a look at what's left in the kettle, well, I'm not seeing like a mountain of hops in this guy. Uh, but then I guess I wouldn't because look, here are all of the hops I added into this hop sleeve. So I think the question is, is this hop matter in this kettle where it wasn't in the sleeve or did it end up getting sucked up into my fermenter? Got pretty close on the original gravity. So 10.49 for the kettle hopped batch and 10.48 for the hop sleeve batch. For yeast, I'm adding global, imperial global, this is L13 and I'm going to ferment a little warmer than the recommended temperature range. I'm going up to 64 Fahrenheit or 18 Celsius. After a few weeks, I cold crashed the beers and pressure transferred to kegs. I took gravity readings from both fermenters and saw a similar final gravity reading for both. So not much of a difference there, but what about the hop qualities of the beer? Well, before we get to that, a quick word about today's sponsor. If you're a fan of Brewlosophy, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at Yakima Valley Hops, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. And these sessions are legit. We recently hosted brewing legend John Palmer, founder of Amiga Yeast, Lance Shanna, and YouTube superstar Trent Musho from The Brew Show. 
All right, let's get to tasting beers. And before submitting anybody else to a triangle test, I figured I'd better give it a go myself. I've not performed very well in these triangle tests, but uh, Hope Springs Eternal. So what I'd expect is that the kettle hops would have more hop oils in here, which I need a little bit more hop bitterness perhaps. Ready to seal one out. All right. <laughs> Beautifully served. Thank you. I don't think there's any difference in aroma. I do think red and green are different, so it's a question of where blue fits. I'm down to foam with blue, so. Green. I'm gonna go with red as the odd one out. Red as the odd one out. Green is the odd one out. <laughs> well. Five, it's not bad, eh? I mean, that's kind of like the law of f***ing averages that you would probably get two out of five right. Yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah, wait, yeah. My wife has given me a one-fingered clap off camera, which I think is exactly what this deserves. I could not reliably distinguish the beers. But perhaps somebody else I know could do a bit better. So I packaged the beers into three cans, red, blue, and green, popped them in the mail, and sent them to apartment brewer Steve and asked him, can you spot the old one out? All right, what's going on, Martin? Thanks for uh, sending these over my way. I'm really excited to try them out. So um, I am gonna pour them into glasses. Let's see, we've got blue, red, and green. So starting with blue, all right, cool. Now let's go in for the uh, the tasting session here. So that's delicious. First of all, that's a delicious beer. It's really enjoyable, um, and just a nice balance of uh, of hop flavor and uh, and light malt character. The overall differences are indeed very slight. But if I had to absolutely put it all in the line, <sighs> no, I'm not ready to make that call yet. One more time. <laughs> I feel like this one might be unique. This has a bit of a um, almost vegetal character, actually. This one's a little bit more bitter than these two. All right, let's find out. I think green is the unique beer. I was right. <laughs> that's awesome. They're, okay, that's cool. First of all, these beers are delicious and um, that's a great recipe you got there, first of all. Um, but when it comes to the actual differences, they are very slight. Uh, but I can tell the difference. That's cool. All right, I'm really happy I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> Score one for Steve, well done. And Patreon members can view Steve's full tasting session on our Patreon page. Now, look, both Steve and I went into this knowing the variable in advance, but what about blind tasters? Well, to find out, I served the beer to 20 participants by splitting the beers across different colored cups. Participants received one cup of the beer where hops were added through the hop sleeve and two cups of the beer where hops were tossed directly into the kettle. A total of 11 tasters would have to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance and a total of only seven did, indicating participants were unable to distinguish a difference. So what can we make of these results? Well. To me, these beers were close to identical, but it's worth keeping in mind that this entire five gallons of beer contained just 22 grams of total hops. In this one data point, the method of adding hops didn't make much of a difference, but I do wonder if a much larger hop charge in, let's say an IPA, would highlight more of a discernible impact. Now, for both of these batches, I was using fresh packets of El Dorado hops, but what would the difference be between a freshly hopped beer and one where the hops were hmm, six years old? Well, to find out how that went, watch this video here.